our last speaker for this portion of the uh, session is Kelly Harrell from Saltwater Incorporated to talk about another really interesting project in the Western Gulf of Alaska. All right, good morning everyone. My name is Kelly Harrell. I'm with Saltwater Incorporated. We are a woman-owned small business that's been providing monitoring service for about 30 years, both ob observer services as well as electronic monitoring, the hardware, software, and video review services. And we and I, the company and I, are both based in Anchorage, Alaska. Today I'm gonna talk with you about how technology and data have supported resilience in remote Alaska fishing communities. So how many of you have been to Alaska in this room? A few? Okay, so just for scale on the map, we are way down here in Bali, Indonesia, and Alaska is, is way far north, very cold, um, uh, in the North Pacific Ocean. So zooming in a bit on the project location, here's a map of Alaska. The largest city in the state where I live is Anchorage. There's about 300,000 people there. The communities where the project was based, they're located over 500 air miles from Anchorage. So it's a small plane ride um, to get to these communities. The ferry runs a little bit in the summer, not too frequently. So it's, they're very uh, challenging to get to. They're remote. Um, the communities, only about a few hundred people in each community, about 3,000 people across um, the entire smattering of communities there. They're highly dependent on fisheries. So Fisheries there are quite productive. There are major seafood processors in the region. Um, and the, if you've seen the deadliest catch, <laughs> those waters are on the other side in the Bering Sea, but the waters here are very rough. The weather's very bad. Um, it's a challenging area to, to live and to operate a fishing uh, vessel. So the fishing fleet profile in the region, they are by Alaska standards, small vessels, which may not be the case for a lot of places, but they are about under 60 feet in length, they're 18 meters. Um, they are distinct from their partners in the Bering Sea, which you may be familiar with, are more larger uh, factory trawl vessels. Um, the majority of these vessels are owned and operated by local residents or Alaska residents, and they do participate in a diversity of other fisheries. Um, I'm gonna talk more about the Pollock fishery, but they uh, catch Pacific cod, crab, other things using other um, and diverse gear types. So the problems that were identified in this project, this fishery, if you see W. Goa, again, that's Western Gulf of Alaska, the Pollock trawl fishery is not a catch share or quota fishery. There are a limited number of licenses, but these boats do compete to catch the allowable amount of Pollock that's available every year. So uh, the monitoring scheme is grounded in an industry-funded observer program, which has historically been onboard observers. Again, these communities are very remote. It's very challenging to get observers out there when they are needed. Sometimes you get stuck for days because the weather gets bad. So it's a major challenge in this region. Another concern is that, as you can see here in the image, when trawling for Pollock, sometimes they catch Chinook salmon incidentally and this is a very highly valued species in Alaska for subsistence and traditional use for recreation and also in commercial uh, fisheries. Also Chinook stocks have been in decline in the North Pacific in recent years. So the, the major concerns and the desire to really reduce and eliminate as much as possible the catching of Chinook salmon in this fishery. So the rates are very low, uh, but because the Chinook salmon are so highly prized it's really an important need to drive down that Chinook salmon bycatch. So managers put in place a hard cap for bycatch in this fishery many years ago. It's now only about 6,600 fish. So that's really not many fish that they have before they get shut down if they hit that cap and any uh, pollock that was left to be harvested is foregone. So in 2017, the fleet nearly hit that cap and in 2019, they did hit the Chinook cap so they were shut down and, and you know, lost money, the communities lost revenue. So again, the challenge here, um, because the observer coverage achieved through the program was only about 25 to 30%, was to figure out how to not extrapolate the data on Chinook salmon bycatch to really have very good data assurance that if any Chinook was caught, um, they knew how many, how many numbers were there. 
Um, so the fishermen were really driven, communities were really driven to change the monitoring program in the region to try and have 100% certainty that they maybe, you know, were not, were, uh, if they were hitting that cap, that that was actual certainty that they were catching those fish. So the partners that came to the table to address uh, this problem, the project was led by the Aleutians East Borough. It's a local government entity um, that represents the communities in the region. They are highly dependent on fish tax revenue and very driven to help ensure the health of the fisheries in their region. You can see a quote here by one of the fishery staff with the Aleutians East Borough. You know, when, when there's an issue that potentially shuts down the fishery, really everybody comes together to try and solve that issue because that's really a critical, critical challenge in the region. So we had a lot of industry engagement. Again, the fishing fleet was really driving this. Um, the Peninsula Fishermen's Coalition led on engagement. And uh, my company, Saltwater Incorporated, provided electronic technology and EM solutions, as well as some of the observers that were um, deployed in the project. Cordata LLC, another small company based in Alaska, helped with the software and some of the tech. And the National Marine Fish Fisheries Service, which is the government entity in charge of federal fisheries management, was a really critical partner um, and was very collaborative and, and eager to see the monitoring system uh, change in, in, uh, in this context. So here's a snapshot of some of the major outcomes and really what happened here was a major transformation of the monitoring program in this fishery over about five years, which is a fast timeline <laughs> in the U.S. for anything uh, policy-wise. So again, um, at the start of the program, there was no use of EM on this fleet. It was onboard absorbers. Now there's 100% use of EM on this fleet. And again, that's voluntary now. The vessels don't have to, to take EM. Uh, but again, they wanted 100% certainty on, on the salmon bycatch numbers. So compliance monitoring is really uh, what they're going after. The Chinook, they're required to retain the Chinook, again, so they can be counted. So we're looking for any salmon that are being tossed, maybe tossed overboard in this fishery. And unfortunately, you know, that was the case before or at the early start of this project. You know, we did see discards happening of Chinook, um, and that was very bad. <laughs> so now there's 100% compliance monitoring on all the trips. Um, as I'll talk a little bit more about, these boats delivered to tenders, so there was a gap in terms of ensuring that no fish were discarded on board the tenders or during offload to tenders, so now we're using EM on the tender vessels in the fleet as well. Human observers, again, were on board the vessels previously. Now they are shoreside um, at the plants for monitoring offloads um, and for biological sampling. There were no logbooks uh, required for vessels under 60 feet prior to the start of this project. Now about 100% of the fleet is using an e-logbook. And importantly, the fishermen really had no tools as well to know where salmon bycatch was occurring and respond accordingly. And I'm gonna talk more about that. So one of the solutions that was developed is a mobile boat system, an EM system for tenders. Again, a number of these boats delivered to tenders and this is a movable system. It uh, is easily transportable between vessels. It's two cameras. It's fairly low cost compared to the harvester system. Installation and removal is done by the crew. And so processors, if they're, they're deploying a different tender when they didn't plan on, they can just kind of pull a system from their processing plant, give it to the tender, and they can be set up. And then we're ensuring compliance um, for discards on these tenders as well. To give you an idea of the number of vessels participating, so again, this is about 100% of the fleet in this fishery. There are about 20 catcher vessels uh, participating in 15 tenders for a total of about 35 vessels that are covered under this program. So uh, neither my company or uh, Cordata involved are really in the business of developing electronic logbooks, but this was kind of a uh, just uh, needed in this case. So we did develop an e-log book, a very simple one that's integrated with the EM system. Um, it has enabled a lot faster, easier reporting for fishermen and processors, and we've improved it over time with feedback from the skippers, and it's provided faster access to fish tickets with the fishermen really like. 
And here's a good quote that really emphasizes the need um, for the next step that I'm going to talk about, which is the fisherman's data portal. So as we know, with, with EM, you know, a lot of fleets are required to put these uh, systems on their boats, but then they don't have access to the data. So that was, again, a key, key driver of this project was to make sure fishermen had access to that data and that they could proactively respond to um, high areas of Chinook bycatch. So the solution that was developed was this fisherman's data portal. It integrates uh, multiple data streams from uh, e-landings, e-log, and EM data. It provides comparison of that e-log data with EM data, and importantly, near real-time mapping of salmon bycatch hotspots. So the fishermen agree to provide access to their data. They can opt into the system. When they opt in, they see um, their information and that of other fishermen. So it's, it's really important that they are sharing, but they're coming together to try and solve this challenge that they all have of avoiding salmon bycatch. So they get automated emails when there are high levels of salmon bycatch, um, and that goes to both managers and processors as well. And here's a good quote from a, a leading fisherman um, in the region that describes the impact of the data portal um, he's describing that, you know, it's, it's providing really important helping them with their decisions when they leave the dock and where they're going to fish to be able to avoid bycatch. And he says it's truly showing what's been caught and we haven't had a closure since we started using the data portal. So just to uh, describe, a f again, a few outcomes. Again, there was no EM use on this fleet at the start of the project. The project, it's been operating under an experimental fishing permit and is going to be fully implemented in 2025. So that's great news. It's working. It's going into regulation. And there are a lot of experienced partners in this project. Um, and again, a lot of buy-in from managers and fishermen to really solve this challenge, as well as the local government. So all the partners were at the table and collaborated, collaborated really closely um, to get the job done. So there's a good quote from Charlotte here about starting with EM was just the tip of the data iceberg, which I'm sure a lot of you um, have described as well and experienced uh, once you start digitizing and, and uh, using technology in one place, you start to realize all the other places where it can add benefits as well. So this project really empowered fishermen with tools that they needed to increase accountability in this fishery. Um, they are better positioned to avoid closures in high bycatch years, and the fleet is already working to adapt the data portal to other fisheries. Just a few quick mentions of some of the other uh, things that we are working on, um, using pretty simple uses of CV and AI to detect humans on deck, um, again, ensuring that they're not out there discarding any salmon. We're also working to collect images of uh, different species of salmon in the plants and to develop an algorithm. The goal is hopefully um, in the plants where observers are used that they can reduce their time in monitoring offloads and that that can be done by cameras in the future, freeing up time for observers to do more biological sampling. We're, this is also a very remote area. so. Um, not a lot of good coverage. We are starting to use Starlink to do remote servicing of the EM systems and also working to um, ensure that the vessels that participate in multiple fisheries can use their EM systems for other fisheries. And just to say thank you to our funders, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and Net, Net Gains Alliance, and Charlotte Levy, um, who works for the Aleutians Eastboro, wrote a really good piece that's on EM for fish. Um, if you want to read more um, from her perspective about this project. Thank you.